Thank you very much, Jenny. This feels a bit like a boxing ring. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be talking with you today about consumer-powered health. Uh, but bef before we do that, I think there's one piece of business that we must accomplish. I want to suggest that we thank President Trump. Yes, thank him. Because all of us working in global health have had our eyes open to some harsh realities and to the urgent need for change thanks to President Trump. So thank you, President Trump. Today I want to talk about power in global health. I mean, is there anyone here who thinks that we need a fresh example of the old adage, power corrupts? It feels like there's plenty of evidence of that around us every day these days. And power dynamics, of course, have always existed. They explain many of our greatest failures, um, our missed opportunities, our deepest shame. And those have been brought to light in recent months in ways that we, I don't think, could have imagined even a few short years ago. The Me Too movement. You know, we were all, I think, aware of some of these dynamics, but this has really forced us to confront this in a much more meaningful way. The fact that power and the power dynamic between men and women, between old and young, between uh, the privileged and the poor, can effortlessly lead to abuse and exploitation. And ironically, it took people with power and privilege to make this reality evident to us, to make us all hear it and to see it. I think the reality is that the power dynamic also has impacted the way we approach our work in global health. You know, for a long time, uh, big aid institutions, um, uh, big NGOs, Global leaders, people like me, have made decisions on behalf of those who weren't even in the room. And very often, we've been wrong. Even the vocabulary we use to talk about aid, I think, bears some examination. Take the widespread use of the word empower. The very notion of it is that I am giving you power. Even in empowering you, I win. So our language reinforces some of these power dynamics that I think are being brought to light in so many different aspects of our lives these days, both professional and personal. As Dr. Tedros reminds us, as Director General of the WHO, we do not serve the people with power. We should be serving the people with no power. This is our challenge in global health. So how has that power dynamic really manifested itself in terms of what's happening in global health? Well, for example, tuberculosis treatment for kids, tuberculosis formulations for kids, and Jenny just was speaking about tuberculosis, are only just now available, despite the fact that tuberculosis medications for adults have been available for many, many decades. And why is that? Well, of course, kids don't have power. Or take women and heart attacks. I mean, women respond to the onset of heart attack differently from men, and they respond to treatment differently as well. But why are there no women-specific therapies in terms of responding to heart attacks? Again, because women lack power. For all of our modern existence, I would say uh, modern medications have become available in markets in the global north, in rich countries, uh, upon discovery, practically. 
but it may take years or even decades for those same medications to be made available in poor countries. So in terms of health, the way we have structured economic relations, the way we've structured the world, frankly, reinforces power for the rich and the absence of power for the poor. Why is something like Cyanopress, D-M-P-A-S-C for those technical experts among you, but Cyanopress, uh, so revolutionary? So, because it's a contraceptive that, of course, allows women to make use of the contraceptive technology without necessarily their partners knowing. But even more importantly than that, is designed for self-administration. So no need for the intermediary of a provider with his inevitable biases. Why is medication abortion so specifically a subject of fear and alarm on the part of anti-abortion activists? Even though it's a therapy that's very safe and highly effective in the first trimester of pregnancy, or perhaps because of that, but the real reason is that it's loose among women. It's loose among women, and uh, they are able to access this technology, again, without the intermediary of a provider, of a physician. There's no man to exercise control. So we at PSI think the moment has arrived to embrace the idea of putting more power and control in consumers' hands. And some of the technologies that we've heard about even today in this conference and innovation and leadership make it possible for us to think about a leapfrog moment in terms of primary health care around putting more control in consumers' hands. I want to talk about four ways in which uh, we see great opportunities for investments by the global community to help speed our progress toward universal health coverage, meeting the SDGs, and embracing this idea of consumer-powered health care. First, put more care and control in consumers' hands. Sounds pretty simple. Take this example of HIV self-testing. Uh, you and I can acquire that at CVS today. And yet it's only, and for years we could have done that. But it's only now becoming available in the most heavily HIV impacted parts of the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. The beauty of this approach is that it breaks down barriers for those who are among the most difficult to reach, and we have to reach them if we hope to attain the 90-90-90 objectives for HIV control. That first 90 is about people knowing their status. Well, this technology allows them to do so in the privacy of their own home or elsewhere. It allows us to reach those hardest to reach populations, including men, and it builds a market for this and other kinds of self-testing technologies. Second, to revolutionize access to contraception for youth. Now think about it. I mean, when young people are contemplating contraception and sex, do you think they think of it in terms of family planning? I mean, did you? <laughs> You're not thinking about planning a family at those moments, right? However, for, for example, a young girl in Tanzania, it's true that her most valuable asset may be her fertility. So how do we design contraceptive offerings that reassure her in terms of the safety of her fertility and meet her where she is? We don't think that, for example, cell phone companies do this. You bet they do. They and all the other world-class marketing organizations, they understand the reality of their consumer and they focus in on that like a laser. I think we need to be inspired by the private sector leaders in this regard. We need to learn from them, and wherever possible, we need to partner with them. Three, improve primary care networks. So we're at a moment now of um, 
renewed excitement, I would say, about uh, the Alma Ata spirit. Now it's Almaty, but in 1978 it was Alma Ata, and when the Declaration of Alma Ata was adopted, it was it launched this focus on primary health care and really was the origin of our whole conversation around universal health coverage. Um, I think it's possible now, after 40 years, to conclude that all of our investments in primary health care haven't yet gotten us where we need to be, haven't yet gotten us meeting that unmet need for primary health care. But it seems like we hold in our hands some exciting possibilities to think about a full-spectrum approach to healthcare. So that's public and private and subsidized and paid and fixed and mobile and administered and self-administered. Um, there are new synergies that are possible now that allow us to reimagine primary health care. And you know what? The Global South is doing this. There's leapfrogging going on right now, leapfrogging over the sort of staid approaches that I would say we've embraced in the global north. And we can point to Kenya or Ghana of a, as examples of countries where the government stewardship of a mixed healthcare system is helping to write the story of those countries' rise. And fourth, mobilizing domestic financing, domestic resource mobilization. Um, peak aid, in the way that we think about aid, at least in my world, uh, may be behind us. But peak population is still well ahead of us. So we need to be creative in terms of how we deliver services, how we think about delivering services. And that means, yes, domestic resource mobilization, um, ensuring that taxes in the countries where we work actually begin to pay more of the costs of national health systems, but also innovation in things like social enterprise or development impact bonds. We heard about development impact bonds on the stage here earlier, or um, corporate philanthropy, or high net worth individual, global philanthropists from the global north and the global south activa activated around a new agenda to mobilize resources for global health progress. I think the opportunity is there to seize those elements and unlock new aspects of um, domestic financing. And frankly, President Trump's repeated skinny budget requests for funding of things like global health give us every incentive to embrace these opportunities faster. So again, thank you, President Trump. So, we at PSI uh, see this as a challenge and a mandate to pull these elements together and work with others, creating a roadmap to reimagine healthcare. We see a future where our consumer has more power and control in her hands and we have less where the resources that she needs to sustain the health system from which she gets services and products come increasingly from her home country, where she is more in the driver's seat. And we think this health care is better health care. But we know that uh, what got us to where we are now is not so easily going to get us to this future um, without some renewed focus and dedication. So I invite you to share in our challenge, and that is to keep the consumer at the center of our thinking in terms of how we deliver healthcare products, services, and outcomes. Understand her reality profoundly, her barriers, those things that drive her behavior. Keep her at the center of our program design, of our project design, of our product design, so that we can truly unlock the possibilities that exist for her. We think the time is ripe to reimagine healthcare, and we hope you will join us on this journey. Thank you very much.